It's my pleasure to welcome and introduce our first speaker today, uh, giving the first of three keynote addresses at this year's Graduate Forum, Professor Mark Hobart. Many of you now know him already, if not from his anthropological, cultural, and media studies work on Indonesia, then from the plenary lecture that he gave yesterday as part of the lineup of skills-based sessions. Uh, we're working him really hard. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't able to make it to that session yesterday. Um, Professor Hobart is Emeritus Professor of Critical Media and Cultural Studies in the Center for Global Media and Communication at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, at the University of London. He's carried out cultural research in Bali and Java over several decades, during which time, I think it's fair to say, approaches to the study of culture have changed markedly. And he's been very much an active and critical contributor to such wider scholarly shifts. Today, Professor Hobart is going to focus in particular on argument, argument as cultural practice, drawing on his long experience of working on and in Bali, but also, I think, in discussion at least, inviting some comparative reflection. Professor Hobart will speak for up to an hour, leaving at least half an hour for questions and discussion. The title of his keynote is How Southeast Asians Argue, Exploring Cultural Differences in Style of Reasoning and Rhetoric. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Hobart. All right. Oh, the sound's working. Right. Thank you for coming, and I will start straight in. Why bother with argument? Aren't there far more urgent topics? Ignoring how people, here Southeast Asians, argue is, I suggest, simple-minded, nostalgic, and dated. It presupposes our current objects of study to be adequate, necessary, and sufficient. When starting out, you assume your subject matter to be stable, coherent, and systematic enough to enable reasoned inquiry. As research proceeds, the limits inevitably become apparent. After a time, the entire edifice creaks and groans under the weight of its own discoveries, which is, I contend, where we are now with many of the disciplines studying Southeast Asia. It does not follow that studying how people argue is the answer. So what exactly am I proposing? It is practice as a more nuanced uh, object of inquiry. That is hardly novel. Anthropologists have played with the idea of practice. So have philosophers like Wittgenstein and C.S. Peirce, from whom we get the term pragmatism. Here, the cultural studies concept of articulation becomes relevant. What we assumed were solid facts, or like solid facts, you measure them, um, are, on closer inspection, practices of connecting different elements that could be, and often are, linked differently under different circumstances. Hegemony is, what you, is when you get the majority of people to accept your particular articulation, for a time at least. Interestingly, post-structuralists such as Foucault or Deleuze explicitly embraced pragmatism. <coughs> Arguing as a practice is my theme. I draw my examples from Bali, because that's the only society about which I know enough to comment. But in discussion, I would look forward to hearing comparative materials. I don't want to start telling you about how people argue in other societies. I simply don't have that detail. This talk is organized as follows. I start with popular arguments against argument, then the theoretical arguments for it. If there is nothing wrong with existing approaches, why mess with them? Even a cursory examination, however, shows existing disciplinary theories to be riddled with incoherencies. Fine, perhaps, for training students, but questionable for cutting-edge research. I mean, just think, for example, of the difference between old-style cancer treatments, which basically you bombarded the body and you hoped to kill the cancer cells before you killed the patient, as opposed now to targeted uh, ones. I'm going to be talking, as it were, about very finely targeted things. I propose instead a more fine-tuned approach centered on practice, of which arguing, I shall suggest, is a prime example. To show how argument is relevant, I review well-known examples from Bali, which show how even eminent scholars come unstuck over argument. Finally, I review culturally distinct ways that argument works in Bali. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, I invite you to think how the arguments might apply to your own topics and regions of expertise. Let me first dispose of an obvious argument against argument. We simply don't need it. What we see is what there is. this culture, politics, economics, agriculture, history, texts, and so on. So we have values and beliefs, political parties and policies, mar uh, markets, development projects, documents detailing the past, literature. What's the problem? Almost everything. The trap is accepting articulations as facts. Such representations are the currency of common sense in which politicians, civil servants, and business people trade. As Gramsci remarked, and you have it there, uh, there's nothing more dangerous than common sense. To mistake common sense for good sense is naive and complicit in hegemonizing. You become part of the problem, not the solution. There are better arguments for dismissing argument. Isn't it just the friction to which even the best oiled social machines are prone? Assuming so enshrines a metaphor of argument as a malfunction to be corrected. Well, we love uh, technical images. Alternatively, in Foucault's words, aren't we just dealing with the trivia, quote, which are said in the ordinary course of days and exchanges and which vanish as soon as they have been pronounced? That, of course, is from Foucault's uh, Order of Discourse, in which he starts about his long journey on treating what he called micro-practices as what everything is constituted of. So, I mean, I'm, I'm hardly saying anything terribly new there. The problem of uh, uh, dismissing things as uh, uh, this way, it rejects, you're rejecting the transient, ignorable every day in favor of the important overarching structures of society and polity. More generally, argument is marginalized in two ways. One is common sense or realist. I'm tempted to call this the Singapore syndrome. We do not need theoretical discussion. It's redundant. The, uh, the other approach misapplies Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, which I mentioned yesterday, to the humanities. It assumes we are in a period of normal science, when paradigmatic assumptions do not need questioning. That misses the point of Kuhn's title, revolutions. In place of the capitalist metaphor of knowledge accuming, accumulating in, inexorably, Kuhn argued that thought is always liable to revolution. And here I can just give it a little shove. There is a yawning gulf between everyday academic practice and the debates of heavyweight thinkers. For example, Habermas treated argument as constitutive of the public sphere. I'm not going to read all the quotes on the board. There's nothing more boring than re looking at something and the speaker talking at the same time. Significantly, Charles Taylor rephrased this as practices, and that is interesting. Uh, social imaginaries, about which I shall have more to say, is not a set of ideas, rather it's what enables, through making sense of, the practices of a society. So when uh, conservatives like Habermas and uh, Taylor uh, link up with Foucault, you start to get worried. Social institutions are not given, but the outcome of a formidable apparatus of procedures and practices. You could, though, still, like Habermas, maintain that every, the everyday is relatively unimportant. What matters are the grand structures of society and polity. Such a stance is problematic. As the philosopher behind cultural studies, Ernesto Laclau, remarked, and this one I will read, any uh, th this is relevant because even Stuart Hall had to admit his theory came from Laclau. So uh, it's slightly awkward to pretend he didn't say anything. Any structural system is limited. That is, it, 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 that it is always surrounded by an excess of meaning which it is unable to master, and that consequently society as a unitary and intelligible object which grounds its own partial processes is an impossibility. But if we maintain the relational character of any identity, and if, at the same time, we renounce the fixation of those identities in a system, then the social must be identified with the infinite play of differences. That is, with what in the strictest sense of the term we call discourse. Now, that's an intelligent definition, not like the rather labored ones that the English-speaking peoples like. The social only exists as the vain attempt to institute that impossible object, society. So the gap between common sense and good sense is startling. All right, but that's not enough, I mean, just to quote uh, Laclau. What's wrong with how things are? We rarely ask, what is knowledge for? 
Is its goal predictive, as in the applied sciences? Is it interventionist, as in medicine? Does it aim to change populations, as in development studies, or control them, as in policy making? Habermas distinguished three purposes of knowledge. First was a technical interest in predicting and controlling the environment. Second was a practical interest in interpreting society and culture better to understand them and ourselves. Finally, there was an emancipatory interest which aims to be reflexively critical of the limits of knowledge. As Southeast Asians are Asianists, our interests are mostly cultural hermeneutic, though to Southeast Asians they may also be emancipatory. In other words, you're learning about yourself to change things and change how people consider you. I wish, however, to consider specifically how the critical may be consequential. In evaluating existing approaches, I'm not dismissing them as useless. Evidently, they work well for many purposes. There are, however, other ways of thinking about Southeast Asia that may further our understanding. The saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But what is it here? How do we know if it's broken? Who said so? You see, if it ain't broke, we'd still all be going around in dog carts. The disciplines studying the region rarely adopt an explicit theoretical framework. Scholars intend, uh, tend instead to draw on existing disciplinary approaches. So when they say they have no need of theory, what they mean is they treat existing arguments as adequate. Mostly, they don't inquire too closely what these presuppose. Unwittingly, they make my argument about argument for me. On this account, disciplines are assemblages of debates and ways of doing things. Let, me, let us consider three disciplines to make my point. Anthropology, history, and literature. It, it applies in similar ways to others. Anthropology is a totalizing science. That's not my definition. Ethnographers realized it took many years to research societies in any detail, like 10 years, and the results were too complicated to allow easy generalization. They needed a quick fix. So quietly, method determined theory be it British social structure and function or American culture. And here I will read this long quote from uh, Jim Clifford. Certain powerful theoretical abstractions promise to help academic ethnographers to get to the heart of a culture more rapidly than someone undertaking, for example, a thorough inventory of customs and beliefs. <laughs> Without spending years getting to know natives, their complex languages and habits in intimate detail, the researcher could go after selected data given that would yield a central armature or structure of the cultural whole. Since culture seen as a complex whole was always too much to master in a short research span, the new ethnographer intended to focus thematically on particular institutions. In the predominantly synecdochic rhetorical stance, that's part for whole, of the new ethnography, parts were assumed to be microcosms or analogies of whole. The appearance of scientific precision, which, oh, by the way, uh, when you go for grants, always aim for scientific precision. People love it. Uh, fun, fun givers, ah, I will come up with a real answer. It's scientific. You don't want to hear, oh, it's very complicated. Um, in other words, behind all this, there's a hidden persuasive argument. Science, scientific is persuasive. Hard is persuasive. Presupposing culture to be a totality impacts on modern anthropology because the postulated unity and coherence of something like culture underpins most study of Southeast Asian peoples. Otherwise, what are we referring to when we speak of the Javanese, Thai, or whoever? There is another sense of culture. It is simply how we do things around here. The latter avoids presupposing um, totality and highlights that somebody is articulating the account itself. It's not just given. There's also who's doing it. I use culture in this sense. Anthropology, I suggest, is only possible by wobbling unwittingly between these two antithetical senses. History is interesting. Most historical analyses are longitudinal. They study institutions over time. Prior events are the necessary condition of subsequent events, which presupposes continuity. To appreciate the issue, try answering the question, will Singapore be the same country in 100 years' time? Yeah. Boo. Your mind goes into meltdown. Of what kind is historical analysis? Is it causal, rational, interpretive, or what? Distancing himself from such intellectual confusion, Foucault tried an archaeological approach, 
of studying the conditions of emergence of different assemblages of practices. In Madness and Civilization, he examined the changes in European ideas of reason and its antithesis, madness. Dissatisfied, he later moved to a genealogical method. That involved examining the practices of power knowledge, like surveying and disciplining, that underpin the institutions that historians study. Turning to literature, the concept of text, which English speakers have borrowed from the French, is well theorized. Unfortunately, leading French proponents, such as Barthes, Derrida, and Ricoeur, disagreed over what they meant by text. So it's amazing the, the uh, English speakers happily talk about oh, text, 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 but in fact the, the ground is one of arguments. Surprise, surprise. This is not obvious in English because text is often treated as an object with properties of unity, continuity, and totality. So there's what Roland Barthes actually had to say about text. It is, in fact, a a range of possibilities, much subtler. A work should not be confused with textuality, which is a field of possibility instantiated through practices. Against the formalist account of the text as basic, unchanging, and knowable, treating the text as a productive activity includes how it is received and used. Analyzing text without readers or audiences is like cooking in a pan without a bottom, and if you've tried it, the results are unpalatable. Attempts to treat mass media products as texts highlight the problem. Take television. What is the text? Is it the original treatment? How the program panned out when filmed? How it was, uh, was after editing? What was broadcast? Or is it how it was received, engaged with, and acted upon by audiences? We like to think the text is the broadcast version, the so-called preferred reading of Stuart Hall. But what if viewers have different understandings, as they invariably do? Appeal to text is not intellectual chic, just nostalgia for uncomplicated realism. Failing to appreciate text as a relationship or assemblage puts the cart before the horse. Academics read, therefore they imagine the object must be text-like, no matter if it is primarily visible or audible. So we reduce complex creations to text through metaphors like film language, what paintings say, instead of treating textualizing as a transformative practice. You're taking one thing and making something else out of it. As the art historian Ernst Gombrich argued, we learn to see and impose sense. And in his book, Art and Delusion, he gives this beautiful example of uh, what, it, what uh, you read into uh, the blob at the back, a house. It's just a blob. The grave difficulty uh, that... Uh, that sense experience is culturally inflected undermines empiricist trust in the senses. There are grave difficulties in trying to express the visible in words. In other words, the articulable. And here I'm using Deleuze's distinction between the articulable and the visible. Consider this clip from uh, Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin. Let's hope this will run. Is it going to? Yes. Uh, moving, uh, but that is, cannot be an argument. There are no propositions there on this, on a narrow account. As the master of montage, Eisenstein was explicit that his efficacy was non-linguistic. Here you can see the terms he, he makes. This is, not, this is uh, of a completely different order. <laughs> 
What has this to do with persuasive argument? No less an adversary than Goebbels remarked that it was, I quote, a marvelous film without equal in the, in, in the cinema. Anyone who has no firm political conviction could become a Bolshevik after seeing the film. So in other words, I'm going to broaden out the concept of argument beyond its conventional boundaries. For training students, regarding disciplines as stable bodies of theory and methods is a useful starting point. It is not, though, a good account of how disciplinary knowledge works. Foucault put the point forcefully, and I will read this because it's a tough quote. And here, this is in his final genealogical phase. If the genealogist listens to history, he finds there is something altogether different behind things, not a timeless and essential secret, but the secret they have no essence, although their essence was fabricated in a piecemeal fashion from alien forms. Examining the history of reason, he learns that it was born in an altogether reasonable fashion from chance. Devotion to truth and the precision of scientific methods arose from the passion of scholars, their reciprocal hatred, their fanatical and unending discussions, and their spirit of competition. The personal conflicts have slowly forged the weapons of reason. So in other words, behind the appearance of order and everything there is that and if you speak to any academic privately, they will tell you that um, things don't pan out neatly. Uh, just go and ask them who they really hate as their academic rivals. We've moved here to a different metaphor of society as dialogic. According to this approach developed by two neglected Russians, Bakhtin and Voloshinov, Systems and structures are obsolete hindrances to thinking. We only need to analyze practices of speaking, thinking, and acting in particular situations. The rest are articulations, monologues, by those in power. On this account, disciplinary knowledge is not a steady state, but an endless struggle. OK, now on practice. When embarking on inquiry, you make working assumptions, such as culture being a coherent totality. You have to get started. Once the problems become evident, which they always do, fetishizing those assumptions is counterproductive. I think we're reaching the limits of what assuming system can tell us. Perhaps it is time to investigate the practices through which structures emerge and are articulated. An analogy is the relationship between conventional chemical experiments and the subatomic processes that make them possible. As Deleuze put it, underlying institutions is pure, ceaseless becoming. What then are the articulatory practices by which something comes to be declared normal, cultural, or whatever? How should we cope with the gap between the, the, uh, the cultural ideal and actuality? Practice really fits cultural ideals. What then does an analysis of practice involve? <clears throat> there are two possibilities. Practice supplements structure to explain the latter's repeated failure. That's Bourdieu. Alternatively, and I prefer this, you can rethink structure as practice. Structure and totalities do not exist naturally, but are attempts to tame pure, ceaseless being. This is not obvious because there are articulatory practices busily claiming the reality of order, system, and structure. That's what we have politicians and the mass media for. So what then do I understand by practice? It is how you cut out an object of study from everything that's going on. A formal definition might be, and here we are, um, uh, to avoid making the concept meaninglessly broad, I restrict practice to recognizable activities by which agents attempt to do something. Examples range from articulating television news bulletins to President Suharto's interminable speeches to how academic departments run. That's a fascinating topic. I would once like to write a book. Um, uh, I would not be very popular. Uh, but with no more ado, let me turn to argument. Many senses of argument are peculiar to European thinking. The English word is not even readily translatable into other European languages. Relying on so Eurocentric a concept hardly seems a promising way to research Southeast Asian usage, does it? However, we should remember the entire epistemology underlying academic disciplines is European. It helps to recognize that double discursivity is inevitable when researching Southeast Asia. By that, I mean we should keep strictly separate and not confuse our analytical discourse with those of our subjects of study. In English, 
Arguing broadly suggests either disagreeing or else discussing and reasoning. You, ca you can uh, try and split argument and argumentation, but in the OED, half the definitions are the same. It doesn't really help. Mentioning the term argument to many Asians invites responses like, we Asians do not argue. Asian values stress harmony, and so on. The first is nonsensical and counterfactual. The second is a popular stereotype. Both need brief mention. Think carefully before choosing the first option. It commits the inhabitants of an entire continent either to lacking rationality or to rigidly culturally distinct forms. The claim has a deeply racist and largely unmentionable ancestry. European colonists in the 19th century reports, uh, reported strange, therefore deficient, uses of logic among, in quotes, primitive peoples. Lévi Brühl theorized the issues in Les Fonctions Mentales dans les Sociétés Inférieures. The translation gives the game away. The mental functions of inferior societies. Woo. Put crudely, non-Europeans or non-Westerners lack the capacity for or habit of fully logical argument. Talk, so if you're going to talk of the rich symbolism and beliefs and rituals of Southeast Asian societies, you land up risking assuming they have not yet learned to adopt true reason. Now that's the argument that once you've got true reason, you don't need symbolism. Dan Sperber is the key author there. Oddly, the argument to this insidious inferential racism is simple. If we accept that criteria of rationality are cultural, the problem vanishes. You'll get uh, philo Western philosophers very upset by that. They're, they're not nice people. More insidiously, stereotyping and self-stereotyping is widespread and naturalized. Naive versions include Asian values, as if you could sum up 60% of the world's population under a single description. So doing neatly and deliberately ignores differences of class, ethnicity, gender, religion, generation, and so on. Let's turn to popular characterizations of Indonesians. I'm not going to read these. You'll be familiar with these kinds of things. I particularly like the last sentence on this Center for Intercultural Learning, that if you disagree with somebody, they will probably uh, resign immediately after the encounter, in which case um, I can think of a lot of uh, academic departments and um, parts of government that would be empty. These representations are remarkable for just how much they leave out. How does Sukarno's compelling oratory fit? What about the massacres in Indonesia in 1965-66 that claimed some million lives? Or is killing people fine so long as you don't argue with them? Wow. What about famously direct and argumentative people like the Batak, Rotinese, or even East Javanese or North Balinese? Proponents of such stereotypes seem to have spent little time in markets or with women outside formal settings when they, they, they can actually get to t tell things as they are. A central Javanese aristocratic ideal becomes a synecdoche, part for whole, for the whole archipelago. So what is going on? Ethnic ideals hide the articulatory role of class and power. Appearing polite and not showing emotion publicly are indices of deference and subservience to authority. It is no coincidence that the more hierarchical a society, the greater the power to demand conformity in public. What goes on behind the scenes is more complicated. We're dealing, I suggest, with social imaginaries. May I remind you of Taylor's definition? The social imaginary is not a set of ideas. Rather, it is what enables the practices of a society. By definition, imaginaries are selective and, being ideal, are often counterfactual but they are myths of great efficacy. They address people so they can recognize themselves as particular kinds of cultural subjects. And I give a quote from Altuze. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. I missed one. That's, yes, Indonesians nice and polite. Anyone, anyone watched television recently in Indonesia and look at the ferocious argument? Wow, what happened? Sorry, to, to Altuze. Um, I know he's, he's rather passé these days, but occasionally the passé can be quite interesting. 